Okay, this question five is what I wanted to spend some time on. Uh, it is laid out in tutorial format, um, but I think it'll be good to uh, draw some pictures at some of the parts, because I think when I was writing out this question, um, I didn't want to make a bunch of diagrams. <laughs> so <laughs> this will be the place to, where in, to uh, draw some of the diagrams. So, so this question says, consider the hydrogen in the ground state. Um, it, this is one zero zero. They are referring to the the three quantum numbers n, l, and m. So this is the ground state n equals one, and in that state l and m can only be zero. And this is the radial. Well, I guess for ground state, technically the the angular function is just one, so doesn't matter. But uh, I think I'm meaning to illustrate only the radial function as a function of r only. Um, for this state, it doesn't make a difference. Um, so just <laughs> to illustrate what I mean, when you actually look at section 8.1 and the table of solutions that they do give you, and this is what I'm saying in the lecture, this is too complicated for us to derive, but we do have enough tools at our level to, if someone gave us the forms of the solution, which are, uh, there it is. Um, if uh, someone gives us the forms of the solution, then um, then we can do things with it. Now, as you can see, even with the first excited state, uh, these functions get super complicated super quickly. So I will try not to, and this is only the first excited state. We are not even talking about n equals three yet. <laughs> um, uh, but I likely won't give you any question involving this excited state. Ground state, it's more manageable. It has one exponential function and it's more uh, manageable. Um, so that's why there's that one homework question. Um, and I guess the way your textbook represents it, they're the, giving these as the, both the, uh, the product of the radial and the angular function. Um, so for this, yeah, okay. Oh. Yeah, all right, I guess that's fine, yeah. So uh, so this is the function we are working with. That's what the question itself is actually giving us. And, um, and once you know what the wave function is, then we can do more interesting things with it. So in part A, <laughs> this long text, uh, um, it says the procedure for calculating the expectation value, it remains basically the same. Um, we just uh, have to remember to generalize correctly. So before uh, what we did was um, for the integrand, we had this, um, the operator um, measuring the physical observable and the probability density. And um, we um, acted well, Technically, this is 100% correct, really. This is correct for the position. Uh, if your operator can be represented with a position only. <laughs> so in that case, the order of uh, multiplication doesn't matter. So you could uh, view it this way that um, you have operator in terms of position function only multiplied to the, the probability de the density and in the one dimensional case, your interval was a one dimensional interval. That interval becomes a volume, a volume element in 3D. So that's, uh, the, that's what this expression represents. This is the generalized version of that calculation procedure we went through in 1D. You know, in 3D, the procedure is basically the same. Now, um, yeah, so, so the tutorial walks you through some of the necessary simplifications you have to do. Now, this uh, I hope uh, reminds you of something that you learned in uh, Calculus 3, in Math 3C, because this type of integral is something that you would have done as part of your training in multivariable calculus. This, uh, this volume element can be expressed in the Cartesian coordinates as dx, 
uh, dx times dy times dz. This is our uh, cubic uh, or yeah, cubic or rectangular uh, volume element. And in the spherical coordinate system, it works out to be this way. Oh, and that's where I wanted to draw the <laughs> diagram of. I remember learning this. Um, and uh, so hopefully all of this is a review reminder of something you learned in your um, something you learned in your math 3c the visualizing this does take a bit of a work and one of the things that can potentially be confusing if you are going back to your math 3c notes is that how we use the letter theta is different and how we use letter phi is different <laughs> from how your mathemat how your mathematics instructor probably used because um we use the correct convention so <laughs> let me draw this figure in our correct physics convention. Uh, if you imagine your co right-handed coordinate system as x, y, z. Oh, let me make sure it is actually correct. x, y, z. OK. Um, then, so let me try to diagram a generalized volume element to somewhere out in space here. It can be connected from here to here. And sorry for this uh, ambiguity in the drawing. I'm drawing a three-dimensional thing in two-dimensional whiteboard. So it's uh, necessarily going to look a little ambiguous. So let me just uh, draw a few uh, hints. So this uh, point out in space uh, possessing coordinates x, y, z. Um, I can take imagine taking its projection down to the xy plane. And when I do take a projection down, this will be the its projection in the xy plane. So this is its x coordinate, its y coordinate, and then its z coordinate is somewhere here. That's that point. Um, so the, the, roughly that point is where I want my uh, uh, representative volume element to be at. So. Um, so in the spherical coordinate system, this the volume element looks this way. Uh, it has a, a dimension that's going along the radial direction r that gives me the distance dr in the in my volume element, and it has a raise this in the way. Um, it has a portion of the dimension that's uh, going. Um, going in the, I guess this is the, the direction called, that's azimuthal. That's the kind of angular direction within the xy plane. So there's a, a movement that happens with the change of the angle phi. So let me kind of represent that in the drawing here. Um, so let's see if that's the r, then something that looks like this is gonna be my r times, um, Oh wait, that's not gonna be R times D phi. Let me um, let me hold off on labeling that for just a bit, and uh, so so that's the dimension that's associated with the variation of uh, D phi. So let me just at least write down D phi, and there's a third dimension, uh, and this should be perpendicular. And there's a third dimension that has to do with with, with the variation of the polar angle or what we label as theta in physics classes, that's gonna be represented by this uh, dimension here. So, so that's the, um, th this is the volume element. I've drawn a one, two, three dimensional thing. So let me just finish uh, wrapping up this cubic thing. And uh, as for the dimensions of these, each of the volume element, I already gave the one for the, that comes with a change of r, that's dr. And this portion of the dimension that comes with a change of, of theta, that's relatively easy because I have the radial distance. So this arc length is gonna be r times d theta. What is sometimes a tricky until you reason it through and convince yourself it is the case is really this dimension here. For that dimension, you have to consider the projection on the xy plane because the length of this portion is gonna be the same as length of this portion here. So it's uh, uh, this level arm varying by small amount d phi here. And this length here, that's not r, that's r uh, taken projection onto the xy plane. So um, 
imagining taking that projection there that should be um so i guess i'm looking at this side so it should be r sine theta so so for this dimension here it should be r sine theta times d phi and uh, that's what's represented in this formula here and um, if you are recalling similar thing that's taught in method 3c you should uh, be able to match it up with the change of convention that in your math class you would have likely seen phi here and you know phi here and theta here i, I don't know why mathematicians use the convention it simply does not make sense to me so <laughs> so this is the, the formula given in the physics convention. So when you replace the dv with that, and you choose these limits of integration that you see here, um, so phi, the azimuthal angle going from zero to two pi, that hopefully makes sense. This, uh, uh, this angle can go all the way around and theta can only go from zero to pi. Once it starts to go around then you are tracing over the points that you already have. So theta goes from zero to pi and R goes from, um, well, whatever the volume you're considering, it can potentially go from zero all the way out to infinity. So, so the tutorial uh, walks you through as far as simplifying uh, the things that can be simplified even before you know the wave function. So it walks you through that. Um, so it actually does the theta and phi integral for you, which can be done for this ground state. Um, now, when you look at the, the wave function solutions, you will see that uh, it can be done for an excited state as long as it's um, spherically symmetric, L equals zero state. Once you get to states that have angular momentum, then yeah, you have to explicitly include this theta and phi in your integrals, uh, which is probably one of the reasons I won't ever really ask you to do those. Um, so uh, after completing the angular integral, they just uh, work out to be four pi r squared, then, then you have this integral. And, um, and what the integral ends up being is let me just to write it down here let me write down a copy of uh the wave function solution so that i have it ready because i'm never going to have them memorized <laughs> my psi one zero zero is equal to uh this is the normalization constant oh i guess even the the in uh this all these are just normalization constant and the one that really matters that tells you the behavior of the wave function is this one exponential of minus r over a naught. So it looks like some kind of an exponential decay. And the calculation that you're doing is, um, it's a pretty simple calculation. You just to go through. I don't know if it's uh, simple enough I can do it here on school. I'll give it a try and, I, I'm likely going to invoke um, Wolfram Alpha. So, <laughs> so let me write this out here. Um, so that integral ends up being, uh, let me just pull out all the constants. Uh, so four pi, that's a constant. Uh, so I have four pi over uh, square root of pi times um, one over a to the three half power. And now I think everything else I have is a function of R in some sense. Oh, oh um, I almost forgot this. It should have been uh, four pi squared and a to the three half, wait, sorry, I'm doing the wrong thing. <laughs> Let me just slow down and do this correctly. So four pi is fine. Let me just leave that alone for pi. What I need to make sure that I get correct is this squaring will square this and square this, uh, which means my expression becomes a lot simpler than I was writing down. Instead of square root of pi, it's just uh, pi times, instead of a to some, a naught to some fractional power, it's uh, a naught to the third power. Okay, I think I got that. 
Good. Uh, let me finish writing down the integral. It's integral of, from r equals zero to infinity. I have uh, r squared times r, so r to the third power, and e to the. Um, this is, needs to be squared, so e to the minus two r over a naught dr. And don't you know hastily do oh all the times wait i guess it's not even all the times even so it's fine you wouldn't do that anyway and in any case it goes from zero to infinity so here you could do um so it is possible for you to work out this integral using integration by part but looking at this r to the third power i'm getting i need to do that multiple times so um i'm not gonna do that <laughs> i'm just gonna um uh, let me, instead of all from alpha, let me use the Sage method this time so that um, I'm using proper computer algebra system instead of, um, instead of, you know, easy online tool. I mean, in the end, so I, I will tell you this much. If uh, you're getting question like this on in a physics exam, at least at the lower division level, I would give you a table of integral. And one of the things in the table of integral would be exactly this or something similar to that so that you can kind of look up the integral. The most you might have to do is where you need to do some kind of substitution here so that um, so that um, you can do that. Uh, you, you can make use of the function. In, in fact, let me do it that way. So uh, instead of, uh, actually doing the entire integral in Sage math, I will just use this as a way to look up my, uh, it'll be my substitute table of integral. And why is this not, I don't know. Sometimes when you're starting, it takes a long time to boot, boot up. Um, in Windows, the Sage math has to launch some kind of emulator and all that kind of stuff. I'm gonna give a count of five and it's not okay. <laughs> Never mind. Okay, let me just declare. I'm gonna declare one variable because I'm just gonna use this as a way to look up a particular definite integral. And the definite integral I'm looking up is integrate, can't spell, uh, x to the third power times exponential of minus x. That's uh, really the functional form I'm interested in. And I will show you how to handle these uh, numerical coefficients if you have this table of integral. Uh, so I'm integrating from x equals zero to infinity. Do I spell out infinity? Let me give that a try. Six, uh, that doesn't, does that help me? Oh, I think that helps me. Okay, so I have that. So let's uh, imagine that you have a table of integral, which you told you this, that if you have um, integral of, um, so x equals zero to infinity, x to the third power, e to the minus x dx uh, is equal to six. Um, and this is something that you could also do on many graphing calculators. Um, with the knowledge, this is what I would do. Uh, to This is the kind of transformation, manipulation that I would do starting from this expression here so that I can make use of that entry in my table of integrals. I am going to make a substitution, a u substitution. u is equal to minus, wait, not minus, u is equal to um, two r over a naught. So that du is equal to two over a naught dr. So what this substitution does for you is it uh, makes the this uh, input to the special function simple so that it matches what's in your table of integral. You'll have to follow through the remainder of the substitutions. And uh, when you are done, you will find that you can factor out some constant coefficients. So let me go through that. Um, I have 
but I'm doing the substitution and just writing out the integral with those substitutions. I'm going from u equal to zero, r, r equals zero gives me u equals zero, to still infinity, r equals in, r approaching infinity gives u approaching infinity. And instead of r to the third power, oh, let me solve this for r. So r is uh, a naught over two u. So I have a naught over two to the third power. I'm plugging in r, u to the third power, e to the minus u. That was the whole point of defining my u this way, du. And oh, wait, wait, um, dr is equal to uh, a naught over two du. So let me finish writing that. This is uh, a naught over two. D um, D U. Yeah. So so uh, I I guess this is the same thing. So let me just get rid of this and make this to the power of four. So so this is what you have. You have um, you can factor out this constant coefficient. And when you factor that out, you end up with a naught to over two to the fourth power. And this integral of u equals zero to infinity, u to the third power, e to the minus u, du. And this uh, label u is what we call a dummy variable. It's, a, it's the variable that we are integrating over. So it doesn't matter what we call it. We can call it u, v, y, heart, x. So, so this portion here is exactly what's in our integral table. That value of that whole thing, when you are done with the, all the complicated calculation is equal to six. So I have enough to finish putting together my calculation. Let's see, do I want to erase? I don't want to erase it. Um, so, so let me do it in situ here. I can take these expressions that I've written and erase the part that I was working out and I can write in what they turned out to be. So they turned out to be, um, I have a naught over two to the fourth power, a naught over four to the fourth power. Okay, I think I'm beginning to like what I see, uh, times six. Okay, uh, the reason I like what I see is that all these a naught they cancel. Uh, a naught to the third power is getting canceled out, um, leaving just one factor of a naught. And that's great because the Bohr radius has unit of distance as I was expecting to have. And I need to work out, the, oh, so this is one, I still have four to the power of four. I need to work out the remainder of the uh, constants. Uh, Let's see, pi's cancel out. So I have um, four times a six, um, 24 divided by, wait, it feels like I did something, oh wait, that's not four to the power of four. Okay, that's two to the power of four. <laughs> Um, it, it's something felt wrong. <laughs> okay, this is two, so it should be two to the power of four. Um, so, uh, so it's a four times a four uh, or sixteen uh, a lot. Okay, I guess that looks uh, right-ish. Um, so uh, they have common denominator eight. Uh, it, this is eight times three, and this is eight times two, three halves a naught. That feels about right. Let me give that a try. Let's see what we get. Three halves uh, times the ball radius. Uh, yeah, let me scroll and submit to make sure I got it right. Yeah, I think, yeah. So after you go through all the complicated calculation, wait, how was this all lined up? 
<laughs> After you go through all the complicated calculation, you do get the simple answer. Simple, but maybe not quite as uh, expected. Because um, if you're thinking of the length scale just relating to Bohr radius, you wouldn't simply be able to guess this factor of three half. That's really what all this complicated calculation comes down to. We could have guessed that the Bohr radius is somewhere in the answer, uh, but what you couldn't guess was what this numerical factor would be. So. Okay, uh, let's uh, go through the remainder of the calculation here. Oh, uh, um, let me just try erasing part of this. Um, okay, I think that's everything I wanted to erase. Uh, okay, part B. Oh, that took a long time. Um, okay, so in the above calculation, the Second term in square brackets can be considered probability density as a function of radius r. Um, so this term here um, is so. Yeah, in our calculation, we combined this r squared with the r, and those different factors of r have different meaning. The four pi r squared that relates to the the surface area of a spherical shell. Um, Anyways, uh, that can be considered to be probability the density. Using calculus, find the value of R max, where the, the probability of R is at the maximum. So uh, I think a lot of times when I say using calculus, it usually means uh, find the, um, you know, find the maximum, as in this is the optimization process in calculus to find where this function is maximum. You take the derivative of the function with respect to the parameter that you want to maximize it with and set that derivative equal to zero. That's really all that is to the calculation in part B. So there shouldn't be any integral you need to do. So <laughs> even though the question has this integral, that's just still distractor, don't let that distract you. Just take this function take the derivative and, and see where the derivative is equal to zero. So the function that I'm taking derivative of is, let me take this and square it. Um, so one over a naught to the third power pi times e to the minus two r over a naught times four pi r squared, this portion here. And um, so when you're trying to maximize this, all these numerical coefficients, they don't matter. So really what I'm maximizing here is r squared times e to the minus 2r over a naught. All right, let's uh, take the derivative of that with respect to r. So when you take the derivative, you end up with, I need to use product rule, so it's going to be 2r times e to the minus 2r over a naught plus uh, r squared times the chain rule. The derivative of the outside is just the same function, exponential of the in, derivative of the inside now gives me minus 2 over a naught. And this the using calculus portion simply means uh, set this equal to zero and solve for R that'll make this condition come true. So, so since the right-hand side is zero, I think I can cancel out a bunch of things. Uh, this exponential function is in both terms, so I can cancel it out. Um, I can imagine dividing both sides by R. So this cancels out, one factor of R cancels out. Uh, let me write down the cleaned up version. So I have um, two minus, 2 over a naught r is equal to 0. Oh, uh, I think I can actually do this calculation in my head uh, without doing any more algebra. Uh, if I set r equals a naught, then left-hand side is going to end up in 0. So this is, um, and you know, this is actually the uh, good meaning of, uh, good physical meaning of Bohr radius to remember, that Bohr radius stands for that's the distance where in the ground state, the electron is most likely to be found. It's kind of has a nice succinct and correct um, meaning that you can attach to Bohr radius. Uh, one thing that I will caution you is 
um, I, I don't know if uh, this fact is um, all that obvious when you look at the the when you look at the the, the electron cloud of the hydrogen uh, ground state because you know that is represented in the textbook section way down here and when you are looking at the electron cloud it's uh, easy to think that oh it looks at the densest in the middle so so that's where electron is most likely to be found. And that's where you have to understand the importance of this four pi r squared factor. Yes, the electron cloud is a densest in the center, but um, as a function of r, the kind of the concentric spherical shell at the radius of zero, that has a volume of zero. So, so it's a, the r equals zero is not the most likely radius. So the most likely radius of is the balancing between this geometric factor and uh, how the electron wave function actually varies as a function of R. So I think that's one of the least intuitive thing until you get enough practice with uh, practice with a multivariable calculus. Okay, uh, I think I see and. Um, C, you can probably do, um, let's see, D. Uh, uh, le let's do D. Um, wait, do I want to do D? I wish I had done D while I was doing A. Because um, <laughs> a lot of the calculation you do, yeah, let me, let me just do that. I think if I just did it quickly without complaining, I can do it in less than five minutes. So. Um, and I will tell you what the uh, the lesson, the moral uh, uh, of the story there is that um, it's going this is gonna be a significant value. Uh, it's actually quite large. So <laughs> let me just set up the calculation. The oh, you know what? The calculation is actually different from what we did in A. So in A, we um, so this is the calculation we did in A. Uh, integral from zero to infinity r because you're measuring distance, average distance, um, and then the psi squared four pi r squared dr. Um, in D, you are not measuring an average distance or anything. So this is actually gone. You are just doing this integral for one. So even your integrand is different. And your limits will, of course, be different because um, so from zero to infinity, that's going to work out to be one. That's the whole normalization uh, step. When you actually, uh, for this calculation, you set the lower limit at A naught. So this, I feel like uh, just, uh, let's see. The, yeah, you know, I think, let me write out the entire integral. I have a feeling it is harder to do um, without an actual computer algebra system or, um, uh, let me see if I can do it this way. Um, well, um, so let me just write out the whole thing. Integral from a naught to infinity, uh, this thing squared, so one over a naught to the third power pi times, uh, uh, let me write out the numerator, uh, just the combining the factor four pi r squared. So four pi on the numerator, and then I have the r squared times e to the minus two r over a naught. Um, I'm staring at this and trying to see if um, I can always. Uh, yeah, let me see if uh, the my computer algebra system will give me uh, indefinite integral. I don't think it will. A great x squared times exponential of just minus x with respect to x without the limit. Oh, wait, wait. Okay, so it is give. Okay, so I think I can do that. Um, yeah, so you can imagine that you have this table of, uh, 
you can imagine that you have this table of integrals uh, that gives you this indefinite integral, x squared times e to the minus x dx is equal to, uh, let me copy that down, minus x squared plus 2x plus 2 uh, e to the minus x plus some uh, integration constant, I assume. Um, so if you have that, then you can do the rest of the calculation this way. You would uh, use, use the same u substitution that I did before, uh, say that u is equal to um, two over a naught r, so that du is equal to two over a naught dr, and this also means r is equal to a naught over two u, and dr is equal to a naught over two du. So let me uh, let me write out the integral uh, with the, the uh, constant factors factored out, uh, the pi's cancel. So I have factored out four over a naught and my integral becomes uh, r squared. So this thing squared. Um, so a naught two, let me do it this way. Um, so I'm gonna leave the limits empty for now. I'll plug those in later except the two infinity, that's fine. Um, plugging in the value of R, I have A naught over two squared uh, U squared uh, times E to the minus U. That was the whole point of the substitution times where I used to have DR, I have A naught over two DU. Okay, so I have um, A naught to the, um, so this becomes to the third power, it's the same factor. And for this lower limit, I have to, oh wait, sorry, um, I went down a rabbit hole without checking. Um, is this, yeah, it, uh, we are fine. Confused myself. So um, we do have to be careful with this limit here. When I'm doing u substitution, I prefer to do the uh, change of the limits at the u substitution. So I'm put plugging in a naught into r. So u becomes two over a naught times a naught. So just a two. That's what this lower limit will become. And knowing that is important. So. Um, let me write down this uh, simplified version. I, I don't think I needed this uh, whole coordinate stuff. So uh, let me erase the coordinate and then uh, finish out this calculation. By the way, um, so I could have saved myself like three, four minutes if I just did it on from alpha and you are allowed to do that. I just want you to demonstrate this uh, technique with the U substitution that turns out to be useful in a lot of integrals you have to do in physics, like upper division physics. So uh, let me write out all the, so I'm kind of writing this out, uh, all the coefficients for over A naught times, um, oh, something isn't right. Oh, I know what's not right. Uh, I think I mentioned the tedious calculation before. Um, a naught to the third power. I missed this power of three there. And the so this is the reason that we teach people to check units, uh, simplify things as you go. Um, the reason I saw that uh, what I had before here was just not right is because I expect my final quantity to be unitless. And um, with this integral um, and with the limit time plugging in, the integral is not gonna give me any kind, it's gonna give me a unitless number. So all these uh, powers of A naught, they all had to cancel out somehow. So having just A naught, not A naught to the third power here would have messed up my unit. So spotted that, fixed that. <laughs> so let me move on. Uh, I have A naught to the third power over two to the third power. 
so that these cancel. And, um, and here is where I have to evaluate my integral. Um, so u, u, not, uh, u squared times e to the minus u du, um, the, the indefinite integral, my uh, table of integral says that that's equal to minus x squared plus 2x plus 2 e to the minus x, um, evaluated at going from going from zero, uh, sorry, not zero, two, to infinity. Hmm. So what this plugging in the limits mean is, well, you evaluated it. Let's see what I get when I plugging in infinity. And you might be thinking with infinity to, power of two, that doesn't make sense. So that's where you should uh, look at it carefully. Look at the limit as x goes to infinity of the expression here, minus x squared plus 2x plus 2 e to the minus x. And you have uh, two parts of the expression here. This portion says that this is going to approach negative infinity. And this portion says that it's gonna approach zero. And this is where having some sort of intuition for your functions is useful. I mean, you could use L'Hopital's rule, but intuition allows you to work it out more quickly. My intuition tells me that this exponential decay for large values of X, it decreases more quickly than, than, the, um, than this uh, polynomial function will increase. So over as x goes to infinity, this wins out, and this whole thing ends up being zero. So my the value of this uh, uh, antiderivative evaluated at the upper limit, that's a zero. So with that, I can do the rest of the limit uh, minus, and I'm gonna plug in two, uh, that's gonna be minus two squared, four plus uh, two times two, four plus two, uh, times e to the minus two. Uh, so, oh, so this is just 10 plus 10. So this entire integral thing, when you are done evaluating it, it's gonna be equal to 10 divided by e squared. Oh, wow, that's gonna be pretty close to one. I mean, not close enough that I can just do, do it, but it's gonna be close enough to one. Let me just do it on calculator. So I have 10 divided by e squared. Oh wait, that's not how my calculator works. 10 <laughs> divided by e squared, that's equal to close to one, but not close enough, uh, 1.35. So that's uh, that, that quantity there, I have that multiplying to four divided by eight. So that multiplied to four divided by two to the third power or eight, that gives me 0 0.677. So um, there's a quite significant probability that the uh, electron is outside the Bohr radius. That's what I was saying before doing the calculation because I've done this calculation enough to have seen it. Um, so, um, so it's, uh, and even, um, even if you take the average uh, radius, there's still significant probability. Um, yeah, here, I don't know if with the average, it might still be more than 50%. I, I guess I'll have to see it though. So, so this is a kind of an interesting calculation that you can do and it, uh, it's doable. Um, one other set of calculation that would be interesting, but I didn't give to you. Um, uh, maybe I'll need to do this on Monday. Yeah, let me do it this way, sorry. I. This calculation took a lot longer than I thought it would. <laughs> we are almost at the end of here. So um, I mean, that's just the way it works out with these tedious calculations. I, I think even if I wasn't talking and trying to explain it, still would have taken good, um, good 30 minutes. Um, and yeah, so I, I, I do think uh, there isn't much in the remainder of this problem set that uh, that I really need to go over. So, uh, yeah, this is something you kind of just to look up. <laughs> um, so, yeah, 
Yeah, so um, 